All right, I'm going to introduce the speaker for this evening. Her name is Melody Heflin, and she is a retired nurse from Lexington Medical Center. And she is going to be speaking to us today about diabetes and vascular related complications. This is being recorded and Melanie will let you know whether you can ask questions during the presentation or if you need to hold them to the end. All right, take it away, what? Melanie. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank you for bearing with me. I am not the most technically savvy in, in the world. I was a nurse practitioner for 27 years. I've been a nurse for 46, almost 47, and um, technology is not my strong suit. But I uh, was in vascular surgery and vascular medicine for the 27 years I was a nurse practitioner. So hopefully I will be able to shed some light on uh, and help answer some questions for you on how diabetes affects blood vessels. So I wanna start with circulation uh, and give you just a little bit about um, how uh, the, the anatomy, so I can hope that this will help you understand the effects as we talk about the pathophysiological things or the diseases and how diabetes actually affects the blood pressure. When I talk about our blood vessels, when I talk about some of that, I'm hoping that this will give you a little bit of background. So we're gonna be primarily talking about arteries. Vascular disease from diabetes does not really affect the veins and they're very, very different. The arteries transport blood to the tissues from the heart. It's a high pressure system because the heart is pumping and pushing that blood through the arteries out to the tissues. As the arteries get smaller, they become what we call arterioles and they carry the blood from the larger arteries out into the capillaries. The capillaries are very important because this is where exchange of fluid, nutrients, electrolytes, and hormones take place between the blood and the tissue fluid. And that's how we get our nourishment is from this blood coming fresh from the heart out to the tissues to provide nourishment. Um, this is, don't get hung up in the complicated terminology that you see on this structure, on this picture, what I really want you to understand here is the lumen or the lining of the vessel, which is called the intima, uh, but it's that inner lining of the vessel. That's what gets damaged by diabetes and high blood pressure and other things. And that's where the problems come in because blood flow gets compromised by blockages in the blood vessel. So that inner lining is important. And then also another place that's important is this muscular layer, because in diabetes, that muscular layer can become hard or calcified, becomes like calcium and becomes can become rock hard. So that layer is also affected. Um, when we talk about some of the things that happen um, it's important to understand the layers and that that muscular layer is affected. And sometimes this outer layer can be affected, but primarily your problems are going to happen inside what we call the lumen or the hole, the tube that it runs through, and then in that muscular layer. So, ma this is yes, ma'am. I hate to interrupt you, but are you switching your slides? I am. Okay. I'm not seeing anything except still the main... Uh, the main title. Are you running on a slideshow? Um, I am. I'm on a slideshow, but I'm switching them myself. May not be. It might be another option under the share screen. Well, it would actually be wait for this. We see you switch the screens. I have no idea because I put it in slideshow. Okay, let me let me uh, let me end the slideshow. Okay, now what do you see now? I'm still you seeing see the, the title um, slide. Okay, now, now I saw something different. Something changed just now. Do you see the slides down on the side? Yes. Okay, well, let me go from this format then. 
Um, okay. And then I'll, I'll just I'll just go down the side with the slides. Okay. Um, so um, so then um, this is the slide where I was talking about the circulation and going from arteries to arterioles to capillaries. Um, this is the diagram I was referring to. This inner tube is the lumen, then the muscular layer, and then sometimes this outer layer can be affected, but primarily the things are going to happen on the inside. Then this slide just shows you the arteries as they come from. Now this um, line you see on this slide is the diaphragm. These are the kidneys which lie under the diaphragm. So the heart is going to be up in the chest above here. And then these are the major arteries. And I'm talking about primarily the arteries outside the heart. In vascular, we send the heart to a heart surgeon or to a cardiology, we just handle the blood vessels primarily outside the heart. So the diaphragm separates the heart from the other organs uh, that are affected by arteries. The main artery coming down through the abdomen is the aorta and it branches into blood vessels that go to the kidneys. The first branch here just above the kidney arteries is the celiac artery, which branches into other arteries that feed the upper part of the uh, digestive system, the stomach, the spleen, the liver are all perfused from there. They get their blood supply from the celiac. And then the superior mesenteric artery, which comes off just below that, provides blood flow to the upper part of the large intestine. And then the inferior mesenteric down below feeds the lower part of the uh, intestine and the small intestine and then other pelvic organs. You have the kidney arteries that come off. These could all be affected. And then it branches into the iliacs, which feed the pelvic organs. Um, and then smaller branches come down into the pelvis. And then they continue to branch. We move over to this diagram that continues to branch down into the leg and they keep branching and branching and branching all the way until you get out to the foot. Now, there are some age related changes that take place in the vascular system. These changes happen as we get older, whether we have disease or not. That's why it's so important for us to try to make sure that we maintain good health and we don't have other issues that can compound the fact that we're going to get older. Um, so one of those is changes in the intima and the medial lining. If you'll remember, I said the intima is that inner lining of the vessel and the media is the muscular layer. So we get changes in those areas that can cause us to have problems with circulation, even in the absence of other underlying diseases. Usually you're gonna see these effects in the larger or medium sized vessels, your aorta in the abdomen, the iliacs, the kidney arteries, those vessels that are, and the vessels that break down into the legs. So what, one of the things you get in that inner lining is an increased thickness in that inner lining. Uh, that affects the ability of things to diffuse or cross over the barrier to get nutrients into circulation into the system. The collagen content of that inner lining increases. That makes it a little harder as well to get things across that barrier and it becomes uh, thicker. Uh, so it doesn't cross over as well. You get a decreased elasticity. So it's not as stretchy. That inner lining doesn't stretch and move like it used to. That's where we run into problems with higher blood pressure just because we're getting older and because the elasticity or the stretchiness of that vessel is not there. Then that outer elastic uh, membrane, the outer layer, uh, it, it doesn't have as much elasticity. So it doesn't stretch as well. So when you got two layers not stretching as well, um, it breaks down and degenerates. So um, that causes problems as well. And remember I said calcification, that elastic tissue can become harder and firmer. It can calcify, calcium deposits develop in that area. And so it doesn't stretch as much. It doesn't give uh, like it used to. So that again helps, um, that, that control of that helps to regulate blood pressure. So if it can't stretch 
and bend and become flexible, then you can have blood pressure issues uh, as well. And then the smooth muscle in the media itself will actually decrease. That causes problems with diffusion of the nutrients. So you get the, the thickening, the decreased ability to stretch and bend and move. And all of a sudden you're not getting the nutrients that you need. It's why some of our elders have such poor uh, nutritional status is because just because of the aging process and then if they have other underlying things it really causes uh, a lot of our frailty that we see and that we can develop. So what do we do to try to help this process? Well there there's some things that put us in a higher risk category for arterial disease and it, this is a process that is known as hardening of the arteries. And to a degree, some of that is true because if you get calcification in that muscular wall, it does become hard and it doesn't stretch as much, but that is somewhat of a uh, incorrect title because that's not all that's happening. So you'll see two columns there. Uh, the column with smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol, sedentary lifestyle and stress, that column is there in that section because those are things we can control. Now, you cannot get rid of diabetes. Once you have diabetes, you're pretty much going to have it unless your diabetes is strictly related to the fact that you've gained too much weight or um, other things that can maybe predispose you. Pregnancy is one that can cause gestational diabetes, and then it's better when you come, when once the baby is born. But for the most part, you aren't gonna get rid of diabetes. You're not gonna get rid of hypertension. Although some people, once again, if you lose weight, you can, some people have been known to come off their blood pressure pills. Those are things that we um, really um, cannot control. Sedentary lifestyle, you have some degree of control over that, but if you're a couch potato, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, these are things we can control. If you're a couch potato, you can get up and you can move, but you can stop smoking. You can take your medications for diabetes and play a role in that. You can take your blood pressure medications, take your cholesterol medications. You can work to reduce stress. The things we absolutely cannot control is we're going to age. We're going to keep celebrating birthdays. We cannot change the fact that our parents, our grandparents uh, had disease. Uh, so that puts us in a higher category. And you cannot change your gender physiologically speaking. You're either, you're always going to be an XX chromosome for women, XY chromosome for men. So even though um, there's a lot of gender things going on today. You still cannot change the underlying fact um, that you're male or female. And we do see more arterial disease in men than in women. So let's define diabetes as we go forward. It's an abnormal breakdown of the carbohydrates, the fats, and the proteins. These high blood sugar levels that come as a result of being able to break down the, unable to break down these things, leads to damage to the blood vessels. Now there's two types of problems with insulin. Some people have an insulin resistance. They have insulin, they're making insulin, but it's ineffective, so they can't break these things down. That's insulin resistance. Diabetics also have a category where they don't produce any insulin or they don't produce enough insulin. So those are two different diabetics. Either way, you are going to have a problem breaking down carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and it's going to result in high blood sugar levels that leads to damage of those vessels. So let's look at what's happening. The, the blood sugar elevations will damage that inner lining. You see the, the little diagram over here. There's a clean vessel, and then there's a vessel that has um, partly blocked, partly blocked vessel. That is called plaque. Um, it is a harder fatty deposits will build up and they form layers and then they build layer after layer after layer until ultimately you have a blood flow that is no longer going through the vessel because that vessel becomes blocked 
Well, when blood is not getting to the tissues, that tissue will begin to die because blood is where life is. Without blood flow and all the things that are in the blood, tissues begin to die. Primarily, we're gonna see effects in the large vessels of the abdomen, the small vessels of the legs, the eye, the brain, and the heart. So you're gonna have conditions that happen in those areas because of lack of blood flow. Loss of blood flow over time will injure the nerves, and this leads to neuropathy. That's a condition that many, many diabetics develop uh, because of that prolonged uh, effects of diabetes on the nerves or because of the loss of blood flow uh, getting to the nerves themselves. So you have a twofold thing that can happen and cause neuropathy, and they can each cause a compound effect where the neuropathy is that much worse if you have diabetes and you have blockage in your blood vessels. Diabetes also makes blood cells more sticky. So if you have some disease and you have those blood cells sticking together forming clumps, then sometimes you can get a sudden condition where blood flow stops very suddenly because those blood cells, blood cells have stuck together and they form a clot inside a vessel that's only partially blocked, but that becomes an emergency right away. The other effect on that blood sugar has is it increases LDL or your bad cholesterol, low density lipoproteins. So because it increases that, it increases the risk of plaque buildup and plaque development because cholesterol will collect inside the blood bloodstream and it also forms plaque. So when you're thinking about all the medications, if you're diabetic and you're on a lot of medications, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit, some of these reasons is why you're on so many medications is because there are many things happening with the diabetic uh, that don't happen with the, a lot of other people. And sometimes it's for prevention. If you have an increased LDL, then they're going to put you on a medication to prevent that from becoming a problem. So let's talk about what organs are most effective. Uh, kidneys, probably we see more kidney disease in diabetics than just about anything. It damages small vessel causing high blood pressure. The reason it does that is because the kidneys are the vital organ that help control blood pressure. A lot of processes inside the kidneys will help to raise or lower the blood pressure as the body needs that to be done. And when those mechanisms start to fail, blood pressure starts to rise and it causes high blood pressure. That can also damage the kidneys and lead to decreased function in the kidneys because of the constant pounding of that sugar. The kidneys is where the sugar is released from the body. So all that sugar is passing through the kidneys to try to come out in the urine and it raises the urine sugar level, that can damage the uh, kidneys and bladder as well. You can have anywhere from mild to complete kidney failure and end up on dialysis from the effects of diabetes on the kidneys. The, the next one is retinopathy, happens in the eyes, that is eye disease caused by diabetes. And this statistic surprised me when I was looking for uh, doing research for putting this together. The leading cause of blindness ages 20 to 74 is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, that's huge. So it's very, very important to protect your eyes because those are teeny tiny little vessels in there. But once you lose your sight, it's not coming back. That's not reversible any more than once you get the complete kidney failure is reversible. In the nerves, uh, we've, I've already mentioned neuropathy. What you're going to see is the toes, the feet, the legs, the hands that can actually spread up the arms. Numbness, tingling, and burning is what happens initially. Now, the numbness, you might say, well, that's not so bad because I don't feel anything. The problem is a lot of people don't get the numbness until way, way advanced disease. And so you're left with this burning tingling that develops early on. And sometimes that can be extremely difficult to live with because especially when you're trying to get to sleep at night, this tingling and burning is causing problems. The other thing is that when you have this numbness, as this develops, you can get injuries because you don't feel 
where your feet are and you step on something and not know it. Um, I've had a number of patients coming into my office and they would take their shoes off. And I had at least two men who took their shoes off and their sock is full of bleeding. And they didn't even know they had stepped on a nail that had come all the way up through their shoe and caused an injury to their foot because they can't feel it. And that sets us on a, a really significant um, path that can be very, can be quite unpleasant um, and can result in loss of limb. The other thing that happens when you don't feel your feet is you don't know where you're standing. So it causes balance problems. You don't feel when you're on an incline. You don't feel when you step on a rock or something like that. It can throw you and people have fallen and gotten uh, hip problems, broken hips, uh, other fractures simply because they didn't know where they were standing because they can't feel the bottoms of their feet. These changes can be very, very subtle. One of the ways that you would know is if you had the inability to distinguish between sharp and dull. Um, and you can have somebody check your feet um, with a, a, a safety pin uh, and a, a ballpoint pin that doesn't have the um, ink exposed uh, to it to anything that's sharp or dull. And if you can't distinguish between those two, then you have early neuropathy. The nerves in the heart and digestive system can also be affected as well as the blood vessels in the heart. This can cause angina and a heart attack um, because you get um, nerve problems and you also get blood vessel issues. The nerves in the digestive system can cause uh, gastroparesis. That's a condition where the intestine is not moving in its normal forward motion. We always think of being hungry when we hear the stomach growl and those sounds that the intestine will make. You may not necessarily be hungry, but you're hearing those sounds because at that point you happen to be empty and you can hear that, but that's a normal motion. Everything should be pushing forward so that the products of digestion go in one part and out the other. When a diabetic develops gastroparesis, it means that motion has slowed down and so they develop nausea, they develop constipation because things are not moving through in a normal fashion and that's from the nerve effects on the GI tract. In the urinary tract, you can get decreased bladder control. You can also get increased urinary infections. Uh, the bladder control is a result of the nerves. The increased urinary tract infections is because all that sugar that your body can't use and it can't store is pouring into that bladder. And if you are not drinking a lot of fluid and keeping that flushed out, that sugar just, the bacteria just feeds on it and you get a lot of urinary tract infections. Because there are small vessels and nerve endings in the sex organs, you can have sexual function that is impaired as well because that requires blood flow and it requires good nerve function. So that can also be a side effect that is uh, worsened with diabetes. In the legs, this causes atherosclerosis. You may have heard PAD or seen that on commercials. That's peripheral arterial disease. And it's where the arteries get blocked and we're going to talk about what happens and what you see. And then in the brain, that causes carotid artery blockage in the neck. That's the primary source of blood flow to the brain. And when the, those, organ, those blood vessels get affected, it leads to stroke. So what do we see and how do you know if you're proceeding down either one of these rows? If your problem is in an artery in the abdomen, anywhere down through the, the stomach area, one of the things you'll see is weight loss. And you see weight loss because if those blood vessels to the digestive organs, the, the intestine, the small intestine, um, the stomach, the spleen, any of those areas, if you get blockage and those areas don't get blood flow, then it causes a problem with digestion. And in the intestine, it's just like what happens in the heart when the heart gets angina, only it's in the intestine and it happens 15 to 20 minutes after you eat, every time you eat. It's called postprandial pain, meaning after meal pain. And what happens is your meal arrives to the intestine and there's not enough blood flow for the process of digestion. 
So you have pain because your, your body's trying to digest, but there's not enough blood flow. Just like in the heart, there's not enough blood flow for the muscle to continue to contract and relax. So you have a heart angina. What happens here is you become afraid to eat because it's going to hurt every time you do that. And so people stop eating and they get weight loss because they're not eating enough because it hurts to eat and it becomes a vicious cycle. So if you're experiencing that, it's the same time, 15 to 20 minutes after you eat, that's something that definitely needs to be reported to a physician uh, fairly quickly so that that can be assessed and determine the de degree of disease and what might be done for it. Embolization is another thing that can happen. It, this is gonna reflect in the toes and in the feet, but it's coming from abdominal disease. And what happens here is you get plaque that is rough or we call it shaggy aorta. And it's because you got spots of plaque up through the aorta and areas where it's either broken loose or where little tiny clots have formed and they shower into the toes. And you see the picture there, that's what it looks like. It's, um, you might think it's bruised, but in a bruise, it's gonna be solid. It's not gonna shatter and go out into the toes like you see here. So if you experience anything that looks like that, that's an indication that something may be going on in the abdomen. And you can see in the lower picture, um, not quite as significant, not quite as severe, but that's an abnormal appearance on the bottoms of the feet. So that needs to be reported. So that's what you're going to see if there's uh, possibly some abdominal disease happening. In the lower extremities, you can have disease and not even know it. They're not, you won't have symptoms because as disease develops early on, you may not stress yourself if you have a sedentary lifestyle. You may not walk enough to have pain in the legs. If you have a heart disease that prevents you from walking enough or lung disease that prevents you from walking enough, you may not have any symptoms at all and still have fairly significant disease. So just because you don't have symptoms doesn't always mean that you're in the clear with arterial disease. Sometimes the symptoms can be disguised. And what I mean by that is, depending on the location of your pain, pain in the legs, sometimes people will just think, well, I have night cramps, or it's part of aging, I'm getting older, I'm just supposed to hurt. That's not true. We don't have to have pain just because we're aging. That is, that is a, a, a myth, so to speak that you don't have to have pain. Other things can happen. You can have arterial disease and it be thought of, believed to be hip pain or back pain. And it can actually be arterial disease that's happening in your extremities. So um, don't just decide that that is something that you're gonna have to live with because you're getting older. Um, one of the things that is very distinct about pain in the lower extremities is that it is consistent. So we call this intermittent claudication what you might feel in the lower extremities. It's, that's a fancy medical term for pain uh, in any time you walk. So people have described it to me as an ache. They might say, my legs just get really tired. They just feel like they're gonna give out or they feel crampy but this is consistent. It happens every time you walk, it happens at the same distance and it's relieved by rest. Now what you might see, uh, just it could be something subtle like you're trying to walk from the front of Walmart to the back of Walmart and you can't get to the back of Walmart before this starts up. Or you're trying to walk a block in your neighborhood and you can't get a block before this starts up. And so, you stop, it gets better, so you go again. That is intermittent claudication. That is classic symptom of arterial disease in the lower extremities. As the disease progresses, that gets worse and you tend to be able to walk less distance um, than you were able to walk before. As the disease progresses, then you will get rest pain, which is a hot burning sensation in the foot. 
it's across the metatarsal head, which is the top, you would call the bridge of the foot. Sometimes this can be relieved by dependency. If you notice you're having this, your feet are burning like this at night across that top of that foot and you get up and walk around, it gets better. Uh, or you just hang your foot over the side of the bed uh, and it gets better. That could be a classic rest pain. Uh, rest pain always worsens with elevation. Once you get to the point that you have such severe disease that you're having rest pain, if you elevate that foot, it's going to cause the heart to have to be pumping uphill. And if you have blockages, that's going to dr actually drain blood out of the leg. So if you elevate that foot, it's going to get worse pain. And if the foot gets cold and the body has a mechanism called vasoconstriction, and as the blood vessels constrict to try to re retain heat in the body and it's cold, then that's going to decrease blood flow because the blood flow becomes, when those vessels constrict, they become smaller, so they're not sending as much blood flow to the area. So uh, maintaining warmth in that extremity is very important because that main, helps maintain circulation, especially as disease advances. Numbness, tingling, coldness can start. Now, when I say lots of people will just have cold feet, okay? That's not necessarily a sign of arterial disease. You may just tend to have cold feet because you're, uh, the little vessels just kind of tend to constrict in the outer uh, tissues. If you have good pulses in your feet and they're cold and it's both feet, then you probably don't have arterial disease. If just one foot is cold and the other one is warm, that's a pretty good indication that something is going on in that extremity where the coldness is existing. If the nerves are without blood flow long enough, you're gonna get numbness and tingling, and that can happen even if people are not diabetics. So some of the symptoms uh, in the lower extremities that you're gonna look for, you're gonna take the socks off and look at your feet. They should be a normal pink color. If they're dusky and pale, like you see the toe, if they're dusky, uh, on this foot, kind of pale on this foot, but that can indicate arterial disease. Pale means blood flow is not getting in. This dusky or red purple that can happen comes from a vasodilation. I'm going to show you a diagram about constriction and vasodilation in just a second, but vasodilation is when the blood vessel opens up wide to try to get more blood flow down to that extremity because of ischemia. Ischemia is a big fancy medical word for lack of blood flow. It's not getting enough blood flow. So the blood vessels dilate up and you get this red purplish color um, because the, the veins have dilated up and you're, they're trying desperately to get blood flow in, but it's hard because the arteries are blocked. Um, and again, I mentioned with temperature, check compare sides, uh, one side versus both sides. If you're having trouble with movement, that can indicate advanced disease because once the nerves get to a point where they have been injured, then you will have actual problems with movement. Sometimes the way disease presents, unfortunately, is you can pre present with sores that won't heal. And that may be um, a rubbing of a shoe across a foot. Uh, and that's how we, we investigate and find out. Now the challenge with sores in a diabetic is that diabetes itself causes changes in healing and impairs wound healing. So uh, if you have arterial disease and you have diabetes, it really can be a catch 22 because the diabetes itself helps um, create that sore and keep that sore from healing. And then the vascular disease without good blood flow, you're gonna have a problem with healing as well. So here's the diagram. In this middle, this tube is a normal blood vessel. When they dilate, they get really, really big on this side. And when they constrict, they get really, really small. So in this one, you've got some vasodilation going on in this extremity. The, the pink, the redness, trying to get blood flow. This other foot looks kind of pale. So there may be disease in that, or there may just be, that just may be their normal color. This leg over here has got some chronic vasodilation and it's got vasodilation all the way up to the knee. 
this person probably has long-standing disease and um, they probably have a small vessel disease that cannot be cured. Um, if this person gets an injury on this foot, we probably are not gonna be able to say that because there's probably not enough blood flow to help this person heal this. So we wanna really protect this limb. And unfortunately, this would be an above the knee amputation because you see this comes all the way to the knee. That person would probably not have enough area that they could heal and it would probably be an above the knee um, um, amputation Amputate. because you have to, yeah because you have to have enough blood flow to heal the surgical site and this person probably does not have that this next one shows you this tissue is actually dying because of lack of blood flow uh, the dusky, they've gone from the red purple to a dusky grayish blue color. Uh, this person is, if we can't restore blood flow to this extremely quickly, um, and this may have already progressed to a point where we're not able to save this foot. This would be an, probably a below knee amputation. Sometimes we try to save the foot, but this is already progressed up. You see, this is the ankle right here. So we probably are, are gonna lose a, a below knee amputation with that because there's not gonna be enough foot that we can save in order to try to keep the foot attached to that person. But that's, um, and, and I'm sad to say that we saw a lot of people present like this uh, because when you have such horrible neuropathy, a lot of these people don't feel how bad that foot is getting. And they will present with conditions that you and I think are unbelievable. And how did it get this bad? But it got that bad because they could not feel their feet. Um, I can't say enough about how bad neuropathy is. So this is gonna help us distinguish between ulcer. This isn't a true arterial ulcer right here. Most likely happened, somebody dropped something on the foot or a shoe rubbed this. Another place we can see shoes rubbed that people present with is along the toes. Um, one of the things that happens with diabetes is not related necessarily to blood flow, but is bony structure can change. You see these toes are starting to become little hammer toes. This is what's known as a Charcot foot. It's, it's typical, unfortunately, of diabetes who get bony structure changes. And what happens is you see on this, you have a normal arch. Well, here the arch has completely collapsed and fallen. So instead of the calluses forming up here, like you see form on this foot, the callus forms where the weight bearing spot becomes and the Charcot foot, people develop a callus here because they cannot feel their feet, they don't know it's happening. And so that develops and it's not until they've got a soaking wet sock or they've got blood in their sock or something terrible has happened with that callus and that top breaks off of that callus that we realize they have an ulcer and then they will come in. And these develop because People cannot feel their feet, so they get this big callus. And unfortunately, these people probably were not following protocol, which is a diabetic has to assess their feet. And you have to check them every day because the least little thing can happen and it can turn into something big really quickly. But this is just where there was a callus. That callus broke open. It developed into a really bad sore. And um, that is very, very common, way more common than, than I would like to um, have in, in diabetes. Uh, there's a foot assessment that can be done. Um, your, your, um, your primary care doctor can do this for you um, and should be done um, to just assess and know where your neuropathy is. They, a monofilament is a little thing that this is the the little bend in that it's a very little it's a little plastic monofilament and it should just bend slightly but even in that light touch if you have normal sensation you're going to feel that touch so they'll touch it in five to seven places on the foot to assess for normal si si uh, sensation if you can't feel that then you have neuropathy another way we check for the 
uh, level of neuropathy is to take a tuning fork and tap the tuning fork on your hand and you should feel the vibration in the bone. If you don't feel that vibration, then you had advanced beyond just a sensation to where the bone is no longer conducting sensation. Um, there are some things to watch out for in an acute problem. One of the things that I mentioned earlier was you can have plaque buildup and then you can have a sudden blood clot in, inside a narrow vessel that stops blood flow suddenly to an area. And that will develop into pain immediately. We call it the six Ps. And of course we have a medical term for all those. Um, I'm gonna explain those, but pain is very sudden, very, very quick. And the pain is out of proportion with with anything you can feel because it's lack of blood flow. It will get pale because there's no blood flow into it. So you don't have, you don't have that pink uh, color that you should have um, in a normal extremity. The pulse will go away because the entire artery is blocked. So there will be no pulse in the foot. And poikilothermia is where it takes on the temperature of its surroundings. So it becomes cold, it becomes room temperature, which is not 98.6 like your normal body temperature should be. So it becomes cold. Uh, it'll start to tingle and there will be paresthesias. That's the tingling sensation as the nerves begin to become compromised. And that will progress all the way to paralysis if quick attention is not made to that extremity. That is an emergency. So if anything like that happens to you, do not wait, uh, get to an emergency room so the intervention can take place fairly quickly. In the brain, the symptoms that you're gonna look for indicative that they're carotid artery problems is you're gonna listen, you're gonna look for FAST. That's what you're gonna, that acronym of FAST, you probably have heard that in other places when they're talking about stroke. Face drooping on one side, arm numbness or hand numbness, um, speech, not making sense or unable to speak. So you may be able to speak, but with the words are coming out in a, a nonsensical fashion. People can't understand you. Um, and in the hand, it can be very subtle. It can be something as simple as, gosh, I can't pick up my coffee cup this morning or I can't hold on to this pen that I'm trying to write my name with. Those things, any of those things happen, it's time to get help. That's what FAST stands for. There's another one with the carotids that I just wanna make you aware of. And it happens in the vision. It's a, the fancy medical term for it is amaurosis fugax, but it's where a shade comes down or up over the eye. It's a very classic symptom. And it simply looks like somebody just pulled a shade down over the eye. Um, hopefully this symptom goes away and it doesn't last. But again, if you experience that, anything looking like a shade came down or from the top or up from the bottom over the eye, then you want to um, report that to your physician and get seen as quickly as possible. So medications and treatments that a diabetic may find themselves having to take, um, diabetic medications, oral uh, medications or insulin, some people are on both. Some people have to use a sliding scale to supplement their oral medications. You may be on cholesterol medications to control that cholesterol and make sure it doesn't become a problem because the diabetes can affect your LDL. So sometimes your LDL won't even be up, but you have to go on a cholesterol medication. It's a preventive type thing. The same can apply to blood pressure medications. You may not have blood pressure, but there are some of these medications are used to actually protect the kidneys from the effects of diabetes on the kidneys. So you may be on a blood pressure medication despite the fact that you don't have um, high blood pressure at the time you go on it. Antiplatelets like aspirin and Plavix, these may be used to help those blood cells not be so sticky and not stick together in narrowing areas. Um, so that can, can improve your chances of not having a blood clot in a vessel that has got plaque in it or that has been compromised. Sometimes you, we will actually put diabetics on something to aid circulation, especially if we've got someone who has advanced disease. If disease gets bad enough, then we might be unable to treat that disease. We might be unable to do any intervention. So Platal or Solostazole, as it's also a generic name, 
This has some vasodilating properties, so it can help improve blood flow. It can't be used in heart failure, so not everybody is a candidate for Playtal. Trental is an older drug that works by helping to make red blood cells a little more flexible to get through small, narrowed vessels. So you may be placed on that. Trental, unfortunately, takes several weeks to um, take effect, so it doesn't work right away. So you may have to be on that a while before it, you see any benefit of it. Anticoagulants, these are drugs that interfere with the clotting mechanism so that you don't make a clot. They don't take away your ability to clot, but they do interfere with it so that you don't make blood clots where we don't want them. Coumadin or warfarin, Eliquis and Xarelto are newer drugs that are um, helping uh, not have to be on Coumadin, which has to be monitored. If you are a diabetic and you smoke, you have to stop at any cost. You have to find a way to stop smoking because the number one cause of vascular disease is smoking and number two right behind it is diabetes. So if you've got both of those, you're a sitting duck for vascular disease and you are not doing yourself any favors. And, and I thankfully never smoke, but I know it's the hardest thing that I ever asked my patients to do was to stop smoking because it is so hard. It affects so many things in the brain um, and the habit. So you're breaking the, the nicotine addiction and you're breaking the habit, uh, but you have to stop. Uh, it's, it, you're, you're just asking for trouble um, if you don't stop and the outcome will not be good. There are also exercise programs that you may be placed in. A lot of my patients would go to the supervised portion of this exercise program, get their prescription, and then they would do it on their own. Medicare pays for 36 visits for certain conditions. And so um, if you are enrolled and you're, you're qualified for that program, I would encourage you to do that because exercise works because it helps you build up collateral blood flows. We've all heard the story of somebody who went and had their cardiac cath and they've got horrible disease, but they never had a heart attack because they had such good collateral blood flow. And it's where the small vessels develop up over time to provide blood flow to an area where a larger vessel is no longer working. So we put you in an exercise program so that you can develop your own collaterals by walking a little bit today and a little bit further tomorrow and next week and next week. When you start, you may not be able to walk three minutes without having pain, but six weeks from now, you find that you can walk 30 minutes before your pain starts and you've in essence done your own bypass, which is one of the treatments for sometimes uh, doing getting around blockages. So how do you prevent this? You check your feet every day. Use a mirror to see the bottom, get somebody else to look at them. Wear socks that are light color so that you can see drainage or you can see blood if you have an injury. Do not walk barefoot. And I know in the South, that's, that's tough to say. And a lot of people like their sandals, but it is so important that you don't walk barefoot and that you, that you wear closed shoes so that little particles and little sand and little rocks don't get in there that can injure your foot. Check your shoes to be sure that nothing has punctured the bottom of that shoe every single day. Check them before you put them on, check them when you take them off. As a diabetic, on Medicare, you qualify for new shoes every year and two sets of inserts a year. Why are the shoes so important? The shoes are important because those inserts are designed to help offload so that you don't make calluses that can open up and break down in feet that you can't feel. And I will tell you that it used to, when I started practicing uh, so many years ago, the shoes were ugly. Nobody wanted to go get diabetic shoes, but I will tell you those styles have changed. There are better looking shoes. Uh, and so I can't stress enough taking advantage of that benefit as a diabetic under Medicare. Your primary care physician can start that ball rolling. They do the foot exam and they can fill out the paperwork for you to get that done. Medicare makes it challenging. And I will tell you that Medicare makes it very challenging and hard to get those shoes but that burden should not be on you. That burden is on your physician to be willing to kind of jump through some hoops to get that done because it is critical to prevention and saving your feet is vital. Um, watching your diet to control your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, walk all that you can. Walking helps to build collaterals. 
Um, and even if you have disease, it can improve that. Walking helps to lower your blood sugar. Walking helps to lower your blood pressure. Walking helps reduce stress. It does so many beneficial things for you. I can't stress that enough. Monitor your blood sugar, know what it is. Keep that log, <coughs> excuse me. Keep that log so that when you go to your physician's office, they know what your blood sugar has been doing so that they can help adjust your medications appropriately. Take your medications as prescribed and if they're not working, that log is gonna show that so that they can, can help you get you on a regimen that's gonna keep your blood sugar uh, under control, keep your A1C down, get regular eye exams. A lot of times your uh, doctor can head things off at the pass if they see those little blood vessels changing. Very, very important. See your medical doctor regularly and please stop smoking. Whatever you do, stop smoking. All right, now to figure out how to not share my screen anymore. All right, can you see me back? Whatever. Yes, ma'am, I can. Okay. Ms. Brenda, you're the only one here. Do you have any questions? Yes, I wanna ask because it seems like we are dealing with this with my mom right now. Okay. Um, her big toe hurts and they were saying that it was um, gout, but she's been on, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the medication now for the second week. And today it's, it started back hurting. Her foot doctor requested that she have lab work done and we're waiting for those results. Okay. But um, her, one of the Mm -hmm. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. On the bottom of her feet, I noticed they are like a little discolored mm -hmm. with some dark brown spots on them. Mm -hmm. Is that new, Ms. Brenda? Um, she's had little spots a long time ago, but they seem to be more now and larger. Okay. Um, the big toe, we, that's a classic place for gout. So we tend to, to think that initially and we try to rule that out. And one of the things that will rule that out is if she's taking medication for gout and it's not helping her and the pain is not going away, that's kind of a classic thing. Well, if the pain's not going away, then it must not be gout. Um, right. One of the things, that there, there's a blood, there's a, a test that can be done, it's, uh, we call it an ankle brachial index. And that index is, it compares a blood pressure in the arm to the blood pressure in the feet. And oh. um, they can order that test. Your doctor can order that test. And the blood pressure should be the same in the legs at the ankle as it is in the arm. Or if it's truly normal, it may be even slightly higher. I would not expect hers to be that but mm -hmm. that test can help determine if this is something going on in the arteries and it's called an ankle brachial index. It's a non-invasive test. They just check the blood pressure in the arm with the blood pressure in the leg. Um, does she go to, is she in part of the Lexington system? Yes. Okay. Yes, she is. Yes. She had um, something done to her heart back in June and okay. ever since, you know, we've been kind of been dealing with this, but um, she went to the foot doctor two weeks ago, and I think we go back again this Thursday. The foot doctor can order that. Is the foot doctor at Lexington too? Um, Columbia Foot Clinic. I okay. think it's a part of Lexington. Okay. Yeah, it is. The foot doctor can order that test. Okay. Um, so if you see, if you're seeing the foot doctor first, um, point out to him what you're seeing on the bottom of the foot and say, you know, I just noticed this on the bottom of the foot, these dark spots. And um, I recently heard about, I recently heard about a problem that can be happening. And I'm just questioning because these haven't been as prominent. They haven't been as dark. Maybe they're, they're more uh, and just kind of point that out to them. And I was wondering about this ankle test to see if we can, should check her for blood flow. Is she a diabetic? Well, she's taking medication for it. She's okay. also, okay. she's taking Plavix, um, Eloquiz, 
it's a lot of things that she's taking. She's taking. She's on those the things for. Yeah, she's on those things for her heart. I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. So she's already been diagnosed with heart disease. One of the things I didn't say is that um, this disease can present in, it can present in the carotid arteries. People will present with a stroke. It can present in the legs. It can present in the heart first. A lot of times we'll do a lot of tests on these people. I've had people present to me with a leg problem. And when we send them to get their heart checked out, their heart is worse than their legs. So we have to get their heart fixed before we can come back to the legs because this is it's what we call a systemic disease that means it manifests in blood vessels all over the body and it just mm -hmm. is a matter of which one is worse initially presenting so I'm, i'd be real surprised if she didn't have some um, disease in the legs uh, but you just need to know how bad it is um what right. degree she's, been com she's been complaining of her leg for a long time and i thought that when she had the surgery in June, I thought that um, my sisters would have mentioned it to the doctors and it would have been addressed, but I've since mm -hmm. found out they haven't. And yeah, sometimes it gets almost, like almost two weeks ago, um, she said her hip had been hurting. So I don't know. Yeah, and, but I and will if, mention if she has disease in the aorta, uh, does she still walk? she yes she does my mom is so, 91 and very active oh wow 91 um mm -hmm. so the hip pain can be indicating that there's disease in the aorta so the hips hurt first that's how come it can get blurred and people think well it's back pain or hip pain it's not circulation because my hips and back are supposed to hurt because i have arthritis and that sort of thing and it can get cloudy um but I would just suggest, if you see the foot doctor first, I would just suggest to him that he order that test. If that yep, test okay. comes back, if that test comes back indicating that she's got some disease, then they can make a referral to vascular surgery. Because okay. vascular surgery doesn't just do vascular surgery. Vascular surgery at Lexington also does vascular medicine. Um, my role there for 27 years was to do the vascular medicine, vascular follow-up wound care for people who did after surgery and for people who never needed surgery we were just following their disease and trying to keep them healthy um, so they do vascular medicine as well just because she's referred to a vascular surgeon doesn't mean she's going to have to have surgery but it will get her it will get somebody following her if she has vascular disease okay okay i'm glad i came tonight i learned i'm glad you did too <laughs> okay this is this has been very helpful. It's it's good, informative also. Very I'm good. Glad. Well, Melody, this worked out just fine. Hey, Brenda. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, and you? Oh, I'm doing good. Well, like you said, you lucked out. You got the preferential treatment tonight. <laughs> so I you enjoyed gotta... it. Yes. Will man, this be offered good. again? Will this be offered again? Actually, I'm recording tonight, so this will be posted, and I'll be sending a link uh, to the post. Well, it depends on how long it takes for marketing to uh, get it edited for me, but probably within the week, within the next week, you should see a link pop up in the email where you can go to it. You can access it anytime. And then oh, okay. also, when you're out there, you'll see the links to some of our other diabetes support group recordings too. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Look forward right. to seeing it. Wonderful. Well, Melody, I sure appreciate you taking the time to speak today. You're very welcome. Always Thank a lot you, of Melody. good. You're welcome, Brenda. A lot of good information to be shared. And hopefully I could have you come back and speak to us again, maybe like say when we do an in-person meeting. Okay. All right. Just let me know. Sure will. All right, ladies, I appreciate your time. And with that, I'm going to end the meeting for us and just look for the link to be posted. Okay, okay. thank you so much, both of you. All right. Y'all have a good evening. Have a good one. Bye All right. Bye.